Good morning. So this presentation talks about the causes, effects, and opportunities to mitigate the urban heat island. The presentation is broken into four elements, starting with a discussion of the urban climate system more generally, a discussion of the heat island, so a basic definition of what is the heat island, uh, what causes it, and then we get into a discussion of the effects of the urban heat island. In other words, why do we care about the urban heat island? I'll then talk about some specific sustainable design solutions that cities are thinking about and implementing uh, in an attempt to mitigate the urban heat island and how that might uh, play out in terms of benefiting the urban climate system. But more importantly, I'll conclude with a discussion of some of the feedbacks that are oftentimes not really taken into account in terms of unanticipated consequences when you implement a particular strategy. So to start with, what is the urban heat island? We need to have a common foundation of understanding of what we mean when we use that phrase. Uh, a basic definition uh, from the Glossary of Weather and Climate is that an urban heat island is simply an area of higher temperatures in an urban setting compared to the surroundings. So it appears as a, uh, a uh, island of I on the isotherm plot. So if you look at temperature distribution across a city, you'll find areas of relative warmth, cooler in the suburbs, and as you get out to the rural surroundings, it gets cooler still. So it's the notion that cities cause this island of warm air. And probably the most common representation that you'll find in the literature is this plot here that's attributed generally to the US EPA. And it shows, again, a warming in the heart of the city uh, and cooling as you go out to the suburbs. But this, this uh, definition of the heat island, or this representation of it simply being a difference in an urban and rural temperature is overly simplistic. So specifically, we need to take into account the fact that the urban heat island varies diurnally over the course of the day, typically being largest in the early morning hours. It also varies seasonally. The urban heat island is typically largest in the winter. Uh, it depends on synoptic conditions. So in other words, you can have a large heat island under certain conditions and virtually no heat island, or in fact even a cool island under other synoptic conditions. Uh, it's very important also to recognize that uh, in general discussions of urban heat island, we tend to often forget to specify what kind of heat island we're talking about. And there, there are many depending upon your point of view. So there's, uh, at a basic level, there's the surface heat island, which is a difference in surface temperatures. Uh, but then there's also air temperature heat island. And the air temperature heat island can be thought of as being the air temperature heat island, say, within the urban canyon. At shelter height, uh, it can be thought of as being differences in temperatures above the shelter height and so forth. So when we think about urban heat islands, we need to be more specific when we say, you know, perhaps a city has a, a heat island of three degrees Celsius. We need to be more specific in terms of whether we're talking about near surface air temperatures or actual surface temperatures. And next, just because there's a difference in urban and rural temperatures does not necessarily mean that the cities are causing that difference. So there are other factors that influence spatial variability of surface temperatures and near surface air temperatures, specifically geographic and topographic causation, presence of nearby large bodies of water, or graphic effects of mountains, and so forth. And finally, uh, when we focus too much just on this delta T, we miss out on some other key aspects of the urban climate system in terms of other parameters that really matter uh, as much as temperature. For example, humidity or mean radiant temperature, the, t the effective temperature that, that people will experience as they walk through the urban canyons. So getting to the surface temperature heat island, uh, these are just some nice, pretty images from NASA. Uh, it's very easy to, these days to get these kinds of images. NASA flies these ER2. It's basically a modified U2 spy plane uh, 
uh, or you can get it from satellite data where you have radiometers that are looking down at emissions of thermal radiation from the surface, and you can estimate surface temperatures, and, and you can then see differences in temperatures across the city. Uh, more recently, there's been uh, a nice development in handheld infrared thermo thermography that allows us to actually get surface temperature data using nice little handheld instruments. This just happens to demonstrate a couple of scenes of a uh, street scene in, in Portland where you can clearly see highly reflective surfaces, less reflective surfaces, and shaded surfaces affecting the surface temperature. Now this does not necessarily mean that the air temperature here is much different from here or above this truck here. That depends a lot on the exchange processes between the air and the surfaces. So as I'm going to argue, we really care a lot about the air temperature heat island and that's something that you don't get remotely. You need to actually have sensors in the urban setting. So for example, if we looked at a remote sensed image of Hong Kong, we would see a lot of rooftops and the people are exposed to the urban heat island effect deep in the canyons of the city, uh, as well as through the vertical column of air that affects air conditioning loads in the buildings. So it's important to be able to have measurements of the air temperature heat island. Now, one strategy that you can use for that is mobile traverses. So this is a plot of mobile traverse data that we did for Hong Kong, where I uh, collaborated with one of my former postdocs who was then a professor at the University of Hong Kong. We took some students and uh, instrumented taxis and drove six taxis across the city and using a system that automatically data logs location, temperature, and humidity, we're able to get a good representation of the urban heat island effect uh, across the city of Hong Kong uh, within the urban canyon space where people are exposed. So having talked a little bit about what urban heat islands look like and how we measure them, uh, now let's get to a discussion of the underlying causes. What causes the urban heat island? Why do temperatures differ across the city? And this little graphic here highlights some of the key factors. Probably the most significant factor that we tend to focus on is that of shortwave radiation and the differences between the cities and rural environments in terms of how the surfaces intercept, absorb, and reflect shortwave solar radiation. So specifically, cities tend to have darker surfaces. They also tend to have deeper canyons where radiation is reflected and uh, absorbed partially by multiple surfaces. Another key contributor to the heat island is latent heat. So cities are, are uh, known to have relatively uh, large amounts of impervious surfaces, concrete, cement, building materials that don't allow moisture to seep into a soil for later evaporative cooling of the surface. Rather, that moisture goes into storm sewers uh, and also there tends to be a lack of vegetation, so you have less, less transpiration from, from plants. So again, the city doesn't evaporatively cool itself very well. There are also other complications in terms of thermal mass of cities, long wave radiation exchange in urban canyons, the fact that the street level surfaces don't see much of the sky, they see a lot of other warm surfaces. And another thing that only maybe in the last 10 years started to, uh, to be recognized as a key contributor to the heat island is anthropogenic heating. And that is waste heat emitted from energy use from the transportation sector, buildings, and industry. And as I'll show, that is actually a fairly significant component of the contributors to the heat island. So this, uh, image, again, using a handheld inferometer, uh, radiometer, sorry, from uh, a, a building rooftop, we were able to look at, this is my building in Portland, which has a, a relatively highly reflective TPO membrane. Here's a nearby city building with a much darker membrane. And as you would expect, 
the surface temperature heat islands are quite different. Uh, our surface temperatures are quite different, different in that on a hot summer day, our rooftop only got to be about 43 degrees Celsius, whereas the city's rooftop got to be about 65 Celsius. So obviously, the, the surface reflectivity or albedo uh, can play a large role in affecting surface temperatures, which then affects air temperatures through convective exchange. Uh, getting to the evaporative cooling issue, a lot of cities, as they developed, poured a lot of impervious surface, concrete and asphalt, parking lots and streets. And it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, more recently, a lot of cities are starting to green themselves, either through street trees or other strategies to provide a mechanism to retain moisture in the city and provide for that evaporative cooling effect. I mentioned radiation trapping and thermal mass. Again, as this solar radiation uh, enters a canyon of a city, it is partially absorbed by a surface, uh, partially reflected. That reflected radiation oftentimes is intercepted by other surfaces partially absorbed, partially reflected. And at each of these surfaces, there's also the potential, because we're talking about buildings, of this energy actually transmitting through the glazing of the building, through the windows. So the geometry, the relative heights and, and widths of these canyons, plays an important role in affecting how much of that radiation is ultimately trapped. So the effective albedo, if you will, of this urban canyon can be much lower than the albedo of any individual surface. Getting back to anthropogenic heating, uh, we've done studies in the past, this is from Atmospheric Environment in 2004, where we looked at citywide average anthropogenic heating. Uh, this happens to show New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. For winter time, uh, the average profiles across the city can range from, say, 20 to, to 40 in the morning hours. They almost always will have a morning peak associated with transportation use and an afternoon peak. Likewise, that, that, that maps to tra traffic and air conditioning peaks. Uh, but those afternoon peaks can be as high as, as 60 or 80 uh, watts per square meter, which is quite substantial. Uh, what's even more important to recognize, however, is that this is averaged over the city. If you take just a block or two of a very dense uh, city uh, where you're, you're looking at the downtown central business district, uh, over fairly small scales uh, of interest, you can find anthropogenic heating that might be on the order of 1,000 watts per square meter. We've shown this, and colleagues in Tokyo have shown this, that you can easily have anthropogenic heat emissions that rival the magnitude of the shortwave instant radiation from the sun. So obviously, anthropogenic heating can be quite important. And so one thing that we've been doing with some of the technologies that we've developed uh, related to traverse measurements is trying to tease out, relatively speaking, what are the more important contributions to the urban heat island and what we're finding is that it depends upon the city, it depends upon the, the season, whether you're talking about early morning heat islands or afternoon heat islands. Nevertheless, what you can do is a measurement study that might involve a combination of traverses as well as fixed stations, and you gather this kind of information, the, the spatial distribution of, of air temperature across the city, you link that with GIS resources of land use, transportation, building energy use, vegetation, albedo, all uh, characteristics that you can obtain at the parcel scale uh, or finer and then map to a grid. And you likewise can map your measurements to a grid. Then you can develop relationships that allow you to assess the relative causation of the heat island. So in this particular instance, we looked at, at Portland, Oregon, and we were able to develop a model from a small set of observational data and the GIS resources that allowed us to, to in a predictive way, 
indicate or estimate what we thought would be the heat island at any of you know, a number of 200 meter by 200 meter grid cells across the city. By having such a model, you're then able to tweak characteristics of the city, change vegetation cover, say, say in a more dense commercial area. And then the model can tell you in this particular situation, this particular city, topography and climate, what that mitigation strategy could do for this particular city. So um, if you're interested in any particular city, in this case I just happen to have the example of Philadelphia, the question really is what are the sizes of these different elements of the pie that contribute to the overall heat island? And as I mentioned, it's, it's a little bit tricky to, to use a phrase like heat island without being more specific. So if you're interested, say, in the mid-afternoon, summertime heat island during a typical oppressive air mass, then you would be able to look at characteristics such as anthropogenic heating, the surface albedos of different, different surfaces across the city, the evaporative cooling potential, so in other words, how much impervious surface, how much vegetation do you have, and the radiation trapping characteristics in terms of the morphology of the city, and use that information perhaps with a traverse study like I suggested before, and you could then create a pie chart that gives you a sense of, relatively speaking, what are the biggest contributors to the heat island for that particular city, and therefore, where are your targets? You know, what, what could I modify that actually has the potential to mitigate the heat island? And it will be different from one city to the next. Here's an example where we tried to look at just anthropogenic heating and ask the question, how can anthropogenic heating affect the heat island? How important is it? And so this again happens to be Philadelphia. And we were looking at observations, which are the black dots, of, of air temperature differences between a, an urban site and a representative rural site, uh, both in the summer and in the winter. And we used a mesoscale atmospheric model to try to replicate those differences in temperatures, that, that heat island signature. The model output is a solid line. And as you can see, in the summertime, we generally underestimated the urban heat island magnitude. In the wintertime, likewise, we underestimated it by quite a bit. Now, when we, in our, in our mesoscale atmospheric model, put in anthropogenic heating, which at the time was, was relatively a new concept in, in the mesoscale atmospheric modeling world, this was back in the early 2000s, we found that in the summertime, the, the dashed line here represents the anthropogenic heat version of our model. And yes, it contributes to maybe uh, three quarters to one degree Celsius elevation of air temperatures in the city. So it can, can be used to explain maybe one degree C of the urban heat island in the summertime. However, in the wintertime, anthropogenic heating represents the vast majority of the heat island. So that makes perfect sense as in the summer you'd fully expect solar radiation is a much more substantial part of the energy balance of the surface. Therefore, the reflectivity of the surface and the availability of moisture for evaporative cooling is going to be more important. However, in the winter, anthropogen anthropogenic heating is going to dominate. So now that we've talked a bit about the heat island and, and um, its causes, we can talk a little bit about why we care. Okay. And there are really three key reasons why we care about the urban heat island. One is air quality. So uh, we, it's been shown that both biogenic emissions, uh, emissions of, of hydrocarbons, monoterpene and isoprene from vegetation increases with air temperature at least up to some threshold where the plants start to get stressed and the stomata start to close down. But there is a fairly strong relationship, 10% per degree C typically, so that's order of magnitude, uh, of increase of isoprene emissions with temperature. Okay. Likewise, anthropogenic emissions, whether it's from power plants associated with increased air conditioning loads, 
or motor vehicle running losses or fugitive emissions, uh, say, you know, fueling station emissions when you're, you're fueling a vehicle, for example, those all increase with temperature as well. So you, you get higher emissions into the atmosphere of precursors to photochemical smog. The heat island also affects a number of characteristics of pollutant mixing and dispersion, and that part of the equation is not always bad, necessarily. The heat island does provide for a ventilation system as this plume of warm air sucks fresher air into the city. So there are some interesting complexities there in terms of how the urban heat island uh, or mitigation of the heat island can affect air quality through mixing and dispersion. Uh, but in general, atmospheric chemistry uh, shows us that the combination of changes in emission rates and rate constants that are dependent upon temperature uh, for the suite of chemical reactions that are part of the photochemical cycle, that all leads to this notion that as you increase air temperatures over the course of the day or season, uh, you get the highest uh, highest uh, quantities of ozone or highest concentrations of ozone uh, only on the hottest days. The second reason why we care about urban heat island is energy consumption. And this too is not a cut and dried story. So depending upon whether you're talking about a cooling dominated climate such as this is New Orleans or a heating dominated clim climate, this is Portland, Oregon, uh, you'll find that the, uh, this is just electricity use, but you'll find that the energy use has this V-shaped profile, where in the winter time, as you increase outside ambient air temperatures, you actually reduce loads on the electric utilities. In the winter, I mean, sorry, in the summer, on the other hand, you increase loads as the air temperature rises. So this is due to increased uh, heating demand, this is due to increased cooling demand. So that all makes sense. Depending upon whether you're in a cooling dominated climate or a heating dominated climate, what you do to the heat island in the summer versus winter can affect these loads substantially. And it's important to recognize that you know, your strategies are, are intended to, to typically reduce heat islands, but you might want to design a strategy that actually targets your particular climate and city so that it has the right kind of benefit in the summer and the right kind of benefit in the winter. Uh, another aspect of the urban heat island that we care about is its role in affecting human health and in, protect, in particular heat related mortality and morbidity. So here's a plot, I think this was a New York heat wave from the 1960s actually, uh, but what you find is that the Heat-related mortality, on average, might be about 3.5 deaths per 100,000. So the shaded region here is what we'd call excess mortality corresponding to a heat wave event. And so what we find is that, that this excess mortality is very much tied to not just the air temperature, but also the humidity, and not just the conditions during the day, but the overnight conditions that allow the human body to sort of recover from an extreme event, but also the length of the event, the duration of the heat, uh, uh, the heat wave event. And one important um, note that's been made in the literature multiple times is this fact that heat is the number one weather-related killer in this country, more so than tornadoes or hurricanes or any other heat-related or uh, weather-related event. Uh, also, we care not just about when people die, but when people get sick. So morbidity also is affected by temperature and humidity, uh, as well as wind speeds. And these all are also, of course, connected with the air quality. And that becomes a very uh, complex uh, thing to disentangle, uh, what, you know, what role air quality has versus heat. But that's an important area of ongoing study. So having talked about what causes the heat island, why we care, well, what can we do about it? Okay. By talking about the causation of the heat island, we've already opened the book on what the possible mitigation strategies might be. So specifically in the transportation sector, 
emit less both precursors to photochemical smog, but also less heat and moisture. That means having fewer cars and more efficient cars on the roads. Uh, it also means doing something about how we park the cars. We have vast amounts of parking lots. What can we do in terms of pervious pavements or shade surfaces? Here's an integrated technology where you have photo, you know, uh, photovoltaic panels generating electricity, but also providing shading for the surface. Um, there are a number of different, different technologies that can help reduce emissions from the transportation sector. The building sector uh, represents 40% of all energy use in this country. As a result, it represents a large fraction of the total waste heat emitted into the urban environment. And also, buildings are one key contributor to that surface energy balance in terms of their albedo. So surface reflectivity of building materials is a key factor that we can look at for, from a mitigation standpoint. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have a, a very white roof to the naked eye. Uh, what a lot of work that's been going on lately has been looking at uh, different coating technologies that visibly are not bright white, but in terms of overall reflectance of the solar spectrum, reflect a good fraction of the energy content of the sun. So it's important to note that only about half the energy of the sun is in the visible spectrum. The other half is in other parts of the spectrum, including the near-infrared. So if you can devise surfaces that are highly reflective to the near-infrared, you can have very highly reflective surfaces that aren't uh, overly gl you know, glare-causing surfaces in terms of a visibility standpoint. So in this example, a traditional surface that's black might have a reflectivity of 4%. You can have an engineered coating that is also the same color black to the naked eye that has a reflectivity of 41%. Shade trees are a very popular technology that's been used for mitigating the urban heat island. Uh, other technologies uh, to help shade buildings and in particular windows, uh, whether it's passive or active shade surfaces on buildings, that's becoming increasingly a strategy that's used to reduce the heat loads on buildings in summer, uh, taking advantage of, uh, of as much daylight as possible, but ultimately reducing the energy consumption of the building. Uh, other technologies that are being implemented in buildings are photovoltaics, building integrated photovoltaics, um, windows and glazing in general. Uh, it's kind of a love-hate relationship. It's both our friend and our enemy. We need we need daylighting in our buildings to help reduce lighting loads, which are a very large fraction of total commercial building energy consumption and, to a lesser extent, a, a significant fraction of residential energy consumption. So we want the daylighting, but oftentimes, we, in the summer in particular, we don't want the heat associated with the penetration of solar radiation through the windows. So there are both passive and active technologies for trying to mitigate the urban uh, or the uh, the radiant load on buildings. This example is one of switched glazing, uh, which allows you to have some control. Uh, and then finally, just overall energy efficiency in the buildings can help to reduce the energy use of the building, which therefore reduces the waste heat emissions. Um, one tool that I wanted to mention that we developed, uh, this is version one of it, um, is something called MIST, or the Mitigation Impact Screening Tool. So we did some work for the US EPA where they asked us, can you give us a, a screening tool that'll help cities and municip municipalities assess how important or, uh, different strategies could be for mitigating their heat island? So you know, if we plant a million trees in a particular city, what will the effect be on the urban heat island? So we developed a tool that was based largely on mesoscale atmospheric modeling of cities uh, where we looked just at street trees and high albedo surfaces. We asked how does that affect the meteorology and then we linked that output with other models of air quality, uh, solely we looked at ozone, and energy consumption. So that tool is available at heatislandmitigationtool.com and we're 
presently uh, trying to negotiate the development of version two of the tool, which we think will be a substantial improvement on the initial tool. Nevertheless, this tool represents a nice little uh, initial step at allowing cities to, to estimate the potential benefits of heat island mitigation for their city. They can look at a you know, citywide albedo modification or vegetation modification or a combination of the two. They can, they can indicate how much of a change they think they can achieve. They press the go button and the tool then tells them what the impacts will be in terms of temperature reductions in the summer, total annual energy use, and peak ozone reductions. So now I want to get to the part of my talk which I think is probably the most interesting because it's potentially the most controversial, and that's this notion of feedback and unintended consequences. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time now highlighting some of the strategies that are commonly used either for heat island mitigation or more generally for sort of sustainability strategies in cities. And I just want to highlight some of the negative aspects uh, or the potential unintended consequences of these strategies. I'm not trying to shoot them down per se, I'm just trying to uh, make you aware that there are other things that we need to consider when we implement some of these strategies. So first of all, here's an example. Uh, it's been shown in the lit literature recently that if you plant trees, depending upon the tree species or the vegetation in general, uh, you're going to get emissions of isoprene, as I mentioned before. And isoprene, uh, if it's near a large source of NOx, say vehicles, then it actually generates ozone. And so tree planting strategies that focus on the sides of freeways or, or you know, deep in the core of the urban city, um, they have to really take into account the, the species that they're planting or they run the risk of actually worsening the ozone problem. On the flip side, what's interesting to note is that if you have the same species of tree emitting in the absence of NOx, it actually acts to help scrub any ozone that's already in the atmosphere out of the atmosphere. So there's some interesting uh, feedbacks here that, that oftentimes are neglected. Another aspect uh, of a strategy that I wanted to highlight is green roofs. Green roofs are becoming very popular in terms of a strategy primarily for stormwater mitigation, but folks putting green roofs on are also uh, highlighting their potential benefits to the energy consumption of the building as well as their potential reduction of the urban heat island. Well, if you think about what you're doing when you put a green roof on, you're putting a thermally massive layer of growing media on the top of the roof. And if you look at data from a variety of studies, you'll always see that the temperature profile for the membrane underneath a green roof is relatively constant on a hot summer day, which is, you'd think, a good thing. Whereas the membrane for a traditional, say, a darker roof is going to have a large peak in temperature uh, during the heart of the day, and it's going to be cooler at night. It's cooler at night because it's not very thermally massive, and it's emitting its, its energy out to space, and hence you can actually get subcooled roof surfaces. So even, that, even if you have a dark membrane on a roof, it will be colder at night than the green roof, and therefore the green roof will be putting heat both into the building and in the urban environment at night, and that can have a slight negative effect both on the urban heat island and as I mentioned, with the heat island, we care about not just the daytime heat island, but the nocturnal heat island, because that's the heat island that tends to be the largest, and that's also a controlling factor in heat-related mortality, how, how cool it gets at night. Uh, so it affects both the urban environment, but it also affects the building, as heat can leach into the building at night, and you have more heat that you have to remove from the building in the morning. Uh, so to try to address this question of, of just how green roofs perform in terms of that energy balance, uh, we did some work for U.S. Green Building Council where we created, first of all, we had already created a, a uh, tool for the U.S. Department of Energy that is part of Energy Plus, the Building Energy Simulation software package that allows us to model using a physically based model the effects of the energy balance of a roof uh, 
that has a green roof, vegetated roof on top of it. And then with funding from the USGBC, we went one step further and we created a calculator that essentially is a database of 8,000 simulations, different types of buildings, different vintages of buildings, and different characteristics of uh, the green roof. And you can then, using this tool, pick a city in a state, a type of building, the size of the roof, and the characteristics of the green roof, and the model will then interpolate results from, from that 8,000 simulations to give you an estimate of, first of all, the annual energy savings of the roof in terms of how it affects the energy use of the building. Importantly, not just as compared to a dark membrane roof, because you know, that oftentimes will give you a misleading benefit because the green roof may not be really competing against a, a dark roof. It might be competing against a white roof as the alternative technology. So this allows you to compare against the dark roof or the white roof. And usually, the green roof will do quite well against the dark roof, saving energy both in terms of, of electricity for cooling and also uh, gas for heating, um, whereas the white roof will tend to outperform the green roof for cooling, but the green roof will outperform the white roof for heating. And the energy costs, which are actually factored into, into this model, then help dictate the overall effect on the energy use of the building and the energy cost of the building annually. Uh, this model also allows you to look at annual uh, sensible heat flux into the urban environment. So that's a, a measure of how the roof construction affects the heat island. Uh, the average latent heat flux to the urban environment, and then also the water balance. So another strategy I wanted to talk about a little bit is you know, the notion of putting photovoltaics on buildings. So building integrated photovoltaics is a very popular strategy now, um, and it has consequences that are often not really thought about. So for example, in this picture here, you have these people rolling out what will would likely be a very low efficiency rollout photovoltaic membrane on top of what was previously a white membrane. So this white roof would have been very reflective to solar radiation, would have protected, protected the building quite well against radiant loads, would have also had a nice benefit for the urban heat island. You put a 5% efficient photovoltaic rollout uh, array on top of the roof in direct contact with the roof it will leach more heat into the building because, because again, it's only 5% efficient and it's a very dark surface. It'll also remain much hotter than the white roof would, so it'll contribute negatively to the urban heat island. Uh, we've done some work where we asked the question, well, can we take photovoltaics, get some of their benefits, but simultaneously get some of the benefits of the green roof system? So this is what we call the GRIP-V project, or Green Roof Integrated Photovoltaics at Portland State. And if you want to learn more about the project, it's at solar.pdx.edu. But the basic premise was the notion that uh, the panels could benefit the green roof by shading it partially, uh, providing a mechanism where in the drought of the summer, you don't need to irrigate the roof and it will survive. Uh, also providing that shading helps to uh, promote biodiversity and changes the makeup of the plants that survive on the roof. Uh, likewise, the green roof itself has a benefit for the panels, which is that you have radiant heat exchange between a much cooler surface down here and the panels, thus the panels operate at a cooler temperature and are therefore more efficient. So that's a, a strategy that we've been exploring. And one of the first papers that we got out of this project looked at how do these different roof strategies affect the energy balance as it relates to the urban heat island? And so specifically, we look at the sensible heat emitted off the roof into the urban environment. If you have a traditional uh, PV roof, so a photovoltaic pa panels elevated above, say, a black membrane or a darker roof surface, you have fairly large sensible heat release into the environment at night. I'm sorry, during the daytime, you know, on the order of a couple hundred watts per square meter. At night, it subcools, and so you actually have a, an urban heat island cooling effect uh, of that photovoltaic array. If 
you replace the roof that's underneath those panels. Remember, the panels only cover a portion of the roof, and so some light gets through and so forth. Uh, if you cover the roof with a white, white membrane or with a green roof, what you find out is that in the daytime, both the white roof and the green roof perform comparably. They both reduce sensible heat to the environment substantially from what you would get from just a traditional roof. Now, at nighttime, however, the green roof stays warm, as I mentioned before, and so you actually still have positive sensible heat gain to the atmosphere uh, at nighttime, whereas the white roof essentially cools off to the same temperature as a black roof at night. Another very interesting aspect of one mitigation strategy that has only come to light recently is the question of how do high albedo paving surfaces, so very light colored paving, whether it's parking lots or roads, how does that affect the buildings that are adjacent to those roads? And what's interesting to note is that if you have a very light surface, uh, it will reflect a lot of the shortwave radiation. A lot of buildings have substantial fractions of surface glazing, and windows admit quite a large fraction of shortwave radiation. So when you have a light surface, a lot of that reflected energy goes into the building, contributing to the cooling load of the building. In contrast, if you have a darker surface, it doesn't reflect much of that solar radiation at all. It's absorbing it, so the surface itself gets hotter, as a result, it heats the air above the surface, so the air that is being either infiltrated or ventilated into the building is warmer. Uh, however, the radiant balance is much more on the long wave spectrum side, so thermal radiation from the hot surface, which does not penetrate through windows. So we have an interesting uh, energy balance here where we've, we've shifted from short wave to long wave radiation in going from a light surface to dark surface. And what we've done, we've done some modeling work on this, as have some colleagues at UC San Diego, and we both find similar results, and that is that overall, if you have a white surface next to your building, it tends to increase the air conditioning load of the building. Okay, that, that's accounting both for the benefits that you get in terms of the cooler air that, that's infiltrated into the building, but also the, the uh, negative effects of that radiation balance. So kind of a surprising uh, effect that's important if you're a city and you're thinking about this as a mitigation strategy. This is just another example of how much shortwave might go through a window compared with long wave. And again, this depends very much on the actual characteristics of the windows, whether it's a single pane, double pane, or uh, whether it's mirrored glazing or not. But nevertheless, it, the, the general trend is the same. Another um, thing I want to mention is that when you have a vision of mitigating the heat island, you're, you're thinking, okay, we're cooling the city. That's got to be all good, right? Well, when you mitigate the heat island, you, you are actually cooling the surface, which means you, you tend to lower the mixing height. Okay? And what that does is that lowers the cap of the volume into which anything that's emitted from the surface is mixed. So whether it's, it's pollution from vehicles and, and, and industry or moisture from plants and soil surfaces, that's all mixed into a thinner mixing layer uh, when you are mitigating the heat island. Therefore, the concentrations can actually increase. So this is a mechanism whereby if you mitigate your heat island, you have the potential to increase concentrations of pollutants and moisture near the surface. Uh, an example of that was a study that we did, I did with uh, Larry Kalkstein and others, where we looked again at Philadelphia, and the question here was, what would happen to heat-related mortality in the city of Philadelphia if we massively cooled the city through a citywide albedo or vegetation campaign. And what we found was somewhat surprising and interesting. So if you look at uh, just, this was a case of a high albedo modification where we increased the albedo of the city across the entire city. 
we reduced air temperatures substantially across the city. That was expected, and that was good. However, we also reduced mixing heights, which is not so good. Okay. That resulted in higher uh, humidity levels near the surface. Therefore, if you think about how heat-related mortality works, it's a combination of temperature and humidity that affects the mortality rates. And therefore, what we found when we, when we linked my mesoscale atmospheric modeling with some of the um, heat-related mortality models that Larry Kolstein had developed, we find that in some instances, mitigating the heat island actually increased the predicted mortality. Okay. In many instances, it did, did still decrease mortality, but there is this mechanism where it can have this unintended consequence. So I'd like to conclude now with a few key points. First, the urban climate is a complex system. Okay. We can't simply think of the urban heat island as a single temperature difference that we're trying to, to reduce. Okay. Second, cities differ. So you can't just have a strategy that you're going to apply in every city regardless of the characteristics of that city. We need to understand the causation of the heat island in each city so we can uh, create uh, fine-tuned strategies that will benefit that particular city. Next, tools exist for evaluating the efficacy of various sustainability strategies. We need to improve these tools and make them more robust because they all tend to have their own, you know, their own focus that they were developed for, thus they have limitations. And finally, uh, sustainable strategies uh, interact, they produce feedbacks, they have far-reaching unintended consequences. So oftentimes, uh, well-intentioned people uh, with seemingly good ideas uh, can implement a strategy that does some of what they expect it to do, but also does some bad things. And so that's, that'll conclude my talk, and I'll be happy to take questions.